Now, you might know Alex Winter as uh, Bill from Bill and Ted, but he has also been a very prolific documentary filmmaker for many years now. And his latest is the film Zappa, which will be uh, releasing in theaters and a video on demand shortly. And he uh, joins us uh, for this interview. So, uh, Bill, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, the first question I want to ask you is, uh, how did you first discover Frank Zappa and and what did his music mean to you when you first like when you first discovered him? Uh, well, I I discovered him in the '70s on Saturday Night Live. I think was the first time I saw him, and he he uh, I knew about his music. My older brother was a musician, and I, I liked his music a lot. I thought it was great. Um, but Zappa is a, is a complicated fellow, and it took time for me to really understand. Uh, quite how great he was in all these different ways. But when I was young, he was as much a popular pop culture figure as he was a musical figure. He was very witty. He was very politically engaged. Um, he was sort of almost as like a, a George Carlin or Richard Pryor as much as he was a, a rock and roll star. And what I'm, I've always been curious because, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people that are into Zappa's music and I'm, and I'm always curious as to what about his his music drew you in because I always find for a lot of people there's like a hook uh it, and maybe it's not a song lyric or something like how you normally think of a hook in music but there's something that brings you in with the, with that type of music with Zappa what brought me in was the contradictions I think that that I'd grown up young thinking of him as this rock and roll guy and then I like came out of college and realized that he wasn't a rock and roll guy at all and there was all this other stuff going on he was making classical music he was doing riffs on jazz riffs on doo-wop um, then there, there was a sort of almost avant-garde aspect to who he was. So what really clicked for me, I think, was was when I got him as an artist. When I went, oh, I see. He's not Mr. You know, guitar noodly rock dude. He's actually a brilliant, uh, pretty much avant-garde classical composer. And uh, the work around that type of stuff, even though that's infused into the rock stuff. So... I like everything from Hot Rats, which goes all the way, I mean, all of his music, but Hot Rats is an amazing album from his early period to an album like Yellow Shark from his later period, which is mostly orchestral classical music. Um, they give you two very different sides of one artist. Now, uh, one of the amazing things about this documentary is you had this unprecedented access to the Zappa Family Trust, which uh, I, I think you brilliantly show in the movie right at the beginning of Zappa, of, in that archival footage of Zappa walking around, you see this just, uh, it, it looks like, you know, an archive, like the National Archives almost, of uh, recording material that he had. Uh, how were you able to get to gain that kind of access uh, like you did to the Zappa Family Trust? Well, in order to make a doc, you have to go right to the rights holders if you're making something like this. And so we did. We went and, and I had a meeting with Gail Zappa and I didn't know if she was going to let us tell the story or not. But she uh, she was a force of nature in her own right and, and had run the Zappa label for a long time. And she liked my take. I think she liked the fact that I didn't want to make a standard music doc. And I think she liked my perspective on Zappa, that he was more of a of a avant-garde composer than than a rock guy but also someone who was very engaged with the times in which he, he came up politically and culturally um that interested me greatly and and gail was very uh taken with the, the that approach but she said to tell the kind of story you want to tell um that isn't so music driven you're going to need access to the vault and they'd never granted that to anyone before and i wasn't asking for it so um, it was a huge honor and a, and a responsibility, um, and it also kind, kind of changed the course of our next few years because there was so much material down there, and some of it was in danger of disrepair and, and, and disintegration that we then raised a bunch of money in, on a crowdfunding campaign and spent the next two years just preserving Zappa archival media. Uh, you, so you said that, uh, a couple of years ago that you started uh, doing this. How long... Uh, ago did you start um, initially laying out the plans for this documentary? About six years ago. Oh wow and and then just two of those years were spent fundraising to preserve that material. Uh, no we we spent two years just preserving the material so uh, we raised the money and then it took us two years to get through all that archival. And uh, I know that um, 
I mean, I know that you've emerged that, you know, to make a documentary like this, you have to immerse yourself in that world. And I don't presume that you can speak for everything about Frank Zappa, but I'm, I, you know, when you, when you see an icon, someone who is an iconoclast like he was, uh, yeah. who, um, who had such, uh, who had such a particular way of doing things. I'm curious, do you have, do you feel like you have any sense of what would be the hardest thing that he would have to deal with in today's music industry if he were still around? Uh, I think that the, the, you know, proliferation of downloading um, was something that he saw coming. He saw the digital revolution coming. Uh, he was very, um, very specific about copyright and about preserving ownership of his material and how that material is distributed. He was also very forward thinking, so I don't believe he would have shunned uh, distributing mu music by downloading, but I think probably he would have revolutionized it. I think that he, he was very, very astute. So was Gail at building contracts for artists that were artist protective. Um, and I think he actually would have helped revolutionize the move into digital had he been around. Uh, you brought up also how Zappa uh, was a very uh, politically minded person, uh, provided one, probably one of the greatest moments ever on Crossfire, um, uh, just below Jon Stewart calling Tucker Carlson a dick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious, what do you, uh, based on what you have observed over these, past, over these years of making this documentary, uh, what do you think he would make of our current, of the country's current political situation? Look, I wouldn't presume to know where he would fall because he was a man of his own mind and every movement wanted to pull him in and claim him. And that's still going on today. I mean, there's so much stuff out there on the wire that, you know, if if Zappa was alive, he'd be a Trump Republican. If Zappa was alive, he'd be a libertarian. If Zappa was alive, he'd be a hardcore leftist. Um, all I can tell you, having spent the better part of the last six years embedded in his world and hearing him talk for hours and hours and hours about what he cared about is beyond party um, affiliations. Zappa was anti-fascism and pro constitution and citizens rights. Um, so I think that tells you a lot about what he'd be fighting for at the moment. So in all, in all of uh, this time that you spent you know, uh, doing all this research and making this uh, and making this movie. What was the most surprising thing that you learned about Zappa in the process of making this? I think uh, somewhat the the level of commitment that he had to his his political and um, global interests. I, I didn't realize quite how much time he spent doing that and uh, how much commitment he put into that. Traveling to Russia, going to other countries to see how they worked and how we may be able to create better relationships with, with the rest of the world. Um, that was very inspiring. I did, I, that was new, and I was looking at media that I didn't know existed and the family didn't know existed, and uh, I was very happy to find all that stuff. I, I have to admit, one of the most interesting things in, that, uh, in this uh, movie was talking about uh, the relationship that he had uh, with uh, then Czechoslovakia and, now, and, uh, and then eventually the Czech Republic. Uh, to the point where he was offered this uh, sort of like this, like in, like sort of like a goodwill ambassador type of position uh, within uh, within their emerging democracy, uh, and how that was tr attempted to be stifled by the Bush administration, I believe. Um, yes. I, I, I may be, I may have, I may be misremembering, but but how did that end? Did they actually successfully force them to remove his title uh, yeah. from? <laughs> they did. Yep. Um, I mean, he was, he, I didn't, I don't go into this in further detail because it's kind of in the public record and I didn't have time in the film, but he was actually blacklisted. Um, and, uh, he lost a lot of remaining airplay and a lot of affiliations with, with radio stations. And, um, there was a, a pretty concerted effort to keep him suppressed, uh, which he just continued to fight. But, uh, yes, they, there was a, a letter sent to uh, Havel by uh, the Bush administration uh, and the chief of staff essentially saying, uh, look, you can either do business with Frank Zappa or you can do business with the, the United States of America, but you can't do both. And that was that. Was he, uh, the, the censorship, was that uh, on American radio or Czech radio? Yeah. 
No, this is all coming out of the U.S. What I'm talking about. Oh yeah. wow! I, I didn't. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I one of my favorite things to ask documentary filmmakers is because you know you you go through so much, and even you know in a, in a movie that's you know two hours like this one, you're not going to be able to fit everything in that you want to. And I'm curious, were there any interesting stories that you really enjoyed hearing about, but for one reason or another, you weren't able to uh, include with, into the documentary? There are so many. I mean, there's there's five other movies there that are not in this movie. Um, but I'm very, very happy with the film that we made. And we focused on things that drove the narrative forward and and, and did that at the expense of, of maybe some footage that fans would like to see that that you'll have to wait and see in some other form, because I'm sure there'll be plenty of ways to get this stuff out there. But... I mean, there's so many great anecdotal things that, that, that went on. I don't think there's anything significant at all um, that, uh, that we wanted to do that we were unable to do. But uh, there's so much anecdotal stuff, of course, that we couldn't do. And, and, uh, and more footage of, of uh, you know, the, the various stage of his, of his career that probably would have sent some of our audiences, audience members packing. But I always got a kick out of seeing Well, um, uh, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best this award season. And to all of our viewers, please uh, like this video, smash that subscribe button, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the best prognosticators in Hollywood. Again, thanks so much, Alex. Thank you. I really appreciate it.